Michelle, are you ready? Tell me about it, stud. Well, all right. She's an award-winning author, speaker, and podcast host who serves on the National Faith Advisory Council. She supported Donald J. Trump for president before it was cool. From her she shed in her beautiful backyard, this is the Michelle Moore Show. Hello, everyone. So glad that you're with us today. I'm Michelle Moore. And just in case you're new to this party. (laughs) All right. So uh, we've got Mark Emery here today. He's an author. And I actually talked about him yesterday being excited he was going to be with us today. He wrote a book on how I beat Satan and the IRS. And so I'm so excited. I told him, I said, look, this is very timely for my viewers and really for our country right now. And um, I just, whew, I'm so glad he reached out to me. And we talked a couple of weeks ago. I immediately knew that he was going to be a great fit. He was going to bring some value to the viewers today. And I am so excited he's here. I don't know when I've been this excited about a show. So we'll see how it goes. All right. Well, we're going to bring Mark Emery in. I'm so excited. Like I said, he's an author. Uh, he wrote, he's written three books, but the one we're going to be talking about today is How I Beat Satan and the IRS. Hello, Mark. How are you doing? Hello. I'm doing excellent. Glad to be with you. Well, I am so thrilled. I was excited when you reached out to me. I knew immediately that we were going to be a good match for you and that you were going to be a good match for my viewers. So, Mark, you wrote a book and it's titled How I Beat Satan and the IRS. Well, you know that grabbed my attention, right? Uh huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> I said, oh, that's a good title. So I am I'm actually an author. I've written a couple of books. And so a great title. I understand how hard it is to get the right title, but that definitely is um, an eye grabber. And I loved it and laughed because I saw the genius in the title. So you've got to share what in the world's going on. The subtitle I noticed is one testimony on how I avoided IRS problems, which is so good too. So let's let's hear it. Tell me what happened. Yeah, well, uh, the title, I love the title as well. It, it, it reminds me of Mark Twain, you know, Satan and the IRS, but then I repeat myself. Uh, I think most people can relate to that. <laughs> so, <Yes>. uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, oh, in the early 90s, I was working for an insurance company and doing quite well, and I made a nice bonus one year. And then uh, as the bonus came along, the IRS also came along, stuck their hand out, and they wanted a big chunk of it. And I thought, you know, uh, I worked for this. They didn't. And uh, I, don't, I don't agree, you know, with, uh, with uh, having a partner. I never asked for a partner. And so that started me studying the law. I started studying the law. There was a particular group that I was in touch with that specialized on IRS matters. And so I started reading their material. And the more I got into studying the actual law in Title 26 of the U.S. Code and the Code of Federal Regulations, the more I realized what a big fraud this whole thing is. You know, things are not the way we believe they are. You know, we're being told certain things that just aren't true. And so the IRS sits upon a house of cards, legally speaking, and the more I got into it on IRS issues, led me to ask the question, well, what, where else in the law is there fraud? And so that started kind of a whole avocation uh, when I ultimately set up uh, my first law club, you know, a bunch of people that simply want to get together and know and understand the law and how to use the law to defend themselves. Okay, I think, I think in the uh, preview on the book on Amazon, it says 11 different ways to be legally compliant and be free, right? So, I mean, we're not talking about doing shady things or doing shady tricks, or you know, hiring expensive consultants to you know reconfigure your life. It's a simple matter of understanding the law, and uh, uh, and so that's basically what the book is about. The book uh, just leads people along the path that I went on, and it's jam packed full of uh, legal references, so that people can clearly understand. Uh, where the fraud is and see it for yourself. This isn't just some guy, you know, blowing smoke. It's more of a legal reference guide combined with my own story. And uh, there's probably a few tidbits in there that I hope are a little bit entertaining. 
And uh, so it's a, it's a quick read, you know, it's more like a pamphlet. It's only 62 pages or something like that. And uh, it's a quick read and I'm yeah. sure people can really benefit from it. Okay, so a few questions for you. In the book, do you cover the 11 different ways to be compliant and be free? Yeah, each chapter kind of hits on a different aspect of the law, okay? As in any law, the first thing you have to ask is, well, who does it apply to? All right, every body of law has a jurisdictional clause and it will define who this particular body of law applies to. All right, and so you have to ask the question, who am I? All right, and am I one who is subject to this law? That's the very first place to start with, with any law. And uh, more and more people are finding out the difference between law and legal and are really starting to achieve a level of freedom in understanding that. All right, we have to understand we are children of God. We, we have been created by, by God and we are men and women upon the land living uh, in the Republic, you know, among the, among the several states. And legislative code uh, really only applies to members of the corporation. Uh, people say, well, the law, you know, everybody has to pay their fair share. Well, uh, sure they do, you know, whatever that fair share is. So let's determine what that fair share is. And depending on who you are, you may not have a fair share that you're obligated to pay. All right. So that's just the very first step. And then uh, the book goes into the other chapters uh, uh, going into, you know, some of the different elements of the Title 26 of the U.S. Code, which is the Internal Revenue Code, um, to, to very clearly outline um, where the fraud is. You know, I could... Well, go that's ahead. very interesting, Mark. You know, okay, so first, you're talking about doing this back in the 90s. You know, right now, this, especially in the last three to four years, it seems like so much of this is becoming public, but you're talking about doing this back in the 90s? Right, uh-huh. That's when okay. it started for me. Okay, so that's, I bet that was a real eye-opener for you because this information was not as readily available as it is now. So share a little bit about that process of realizing, holy cow, nothing is, it's all smoke and mirrors. Nothing is, you know, it, what it seems, it's voluntary. You know, how was that for you? Yeah. Well, that's very true. So many people are waking up to the truth and the truth is really starting to get out there and praise God for that. Um, back in the 90s, uh, still, uh, it, it, didn't, it didn't take much. It wasn't very hard to find people that have been uh, trampled upon, you know, by the powers that be. All right. They, they were out there just as much, you know, then as they are today. <laughs> it's just a lot more open right now. And a lot of forums like your show and others that are bringing the truth to the public and, and that's a beautiful thing. But uh, yeah, at that Thank time, you. at that time, it was a bit of a rarity. Uh -huh. And I was definitely uh, considered an oddity, still am. Uh, and it's probably true, but for a lot of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. We're all meant to be different. You know, we're always feeling like we're supposed to fit in, but really we were all made as a one of a kind. So we got a question for you. Um, did Mr. Emery ever find evidence of the IRS collections being routed to the Crown, the Vatican, and or the 13 bloodline families? Well, I'll give you an interesting little tidbit. Um, I have a, a printed edition of uh, Black's Law Dictionary, sixth edition. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is all American jurisprudence, right? The definitions are taken from court decisions. So you would think being American jurisprudence, if they were going to honor anybody, who would that be? They would probably honor uh, America's presidents, perhaps, mm -hmm. right? For standing vigil and standing guard over the Constitution and defending our way of life and our jurisprudence and our rights and everything else. Well, that's not the case. What you'll find in the back of that book is uh, uh, actually several pages um, showing the lineage of the royal court, the crown, from England, kings and queens of the past. 
And uh, if, if you understand history, you understand you know, where, the, where the Bar Association comes from. It's my understanding, you know, it comes from the International Bar, which is based in London, and is really nothing more than, uh, than an agency of the Crown. Uh, That's right, because the bar is an acronym. Bar is British accredited. What does the R stand for? Registry. Registry. Yeah. Thank you. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And when course, I, so when an attorney who is a member of the bar, right, um, when they get there, when they become an attorney and all that, they they swear an oath to the bar, right? And who right. are so does so that means. Who are they swearing their allegiance to? Who is that oath being made to? Right. It is not Americans, it is the British, it's the crown. Right, and an attorney cannot defend your rights if he has to go against the judge. His first allegiance is to the judge, not the client. I know somebody who went through the pains of going through, uh, going through law school, graduated with honors, but couldn't finally take the oath of the bar simply for that reason, because she was going to defend her client's rights. And if necessary, go against the judge and, and any illegal activities, which are quite common, that the judges perform. But an attorney will never be able to defend your rights um, uh, if, it has to, if he has to go against the judge. If the judge is denying you due process, whatever the case might be, all the nasty tricks they do, the attorney cannot contest that. So. Uh, the only thing that, that I've seen attorneys be really good at, and that is draining your bank account. Mm -hmm. You know. Okay, so well, in your trust account, you know, when you you have a, a CQV trust, and um, we've had whist government whistleblower or corruption whistleblower um, Mike Gill on a number of times. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he owns the largest mortgage company in the country. And um, he has some huge corruption stuff that he's been fighting. He's actually been in hiding for five years. But I was, I've was i spoken with him and had him on the show. We're getting ready to have him on a fourth time. But one of the things that he says is that everybody in the court gets paid. The judge, the attorneys, the bailiff, everybody gets paid something. And, um, and then also I've been speaking with some constitutionalists. Their show is gonna be on, on we're gonna do a special Saturday show this Saturday with them and they um, they're incredible. One of the things that they say, and I did not know this, so we know that like DC is a corporation, right? Right. And then what most people don't know, we just covered this on the show last week, is that um, I was breaking the, um, the, the um, whole information about each state is a corporation, each city and county, they are also traded publicly as well on the stock market. Well, these constitutionalists are saying that the courts are also, many of them are corporations that are traded publicly. I did not know about the courts and the court systems and even school boards and, and school systems. A lot of them are public and traded on the um, the stock exchange or the whatever publicly traded on and they have Dunn's numbers. So can, I mean, that is, uh, or Dunn's numbers. Is that not incredible? Yeah, uh, you can check on your court system in your area and you'll find them listed in Dun & Bradstreet. All right, so if they are truly a judicial arm of the, of the government, why would they be listed as a commercial entity? And you're right, everyone is getting paid in the court system. Every, every uh, ticket, every document, every case number that's created um, in turn creates a bond. And those bonds are traded, and they just make huge, huge money. Uh, you know, much more than you might think on the on the court fees. Court fees are nothing; they're only a, a means to help, help empty your bank account. Right. Okay. So um, through this process, so you 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 know, I think you make a, a phenomenal point um, that you know you've got to first uh, be able to establish if whether or not what is going on is even applicable to you, anyways. Right. So that's your first different way to uh, to be compliant and, and still be free. Right. So when you went through the process, and by the way, a book that's only about 60 something pages is like a pamphlet. So that's phenomenal. That'll be easy and digestible for people. Uh, and we have the link for Mark's book 
uh, in the description for you on our Rumble channel. So if you're watching on the Michelle Moore Show Rumble channel, you'll be able to grab it out of the description or you don't even have to grab it. You just click on it and it'll take him, take you to his book. And I saw on there where there was even a way if you had Kindle to see it for free, you can get it for free. So that's another option. But Mark, um, what was maybe, let's say one of the most surprising things that you ended up learning during this process? Well, um, it all starts off with definitions, right? And I have a chapter on uh, having fun with fraud in definitions. And uh, it comes right back to, you know, who does this apply to, all right? Um, and just going from memory, and I may not get this exactly right, but uh, you think of the United States, you know, in terms of the, the 50 several states. Well, no, if you dig into definitions, the United States means Washington, D.C., all right? So then uh, the definition of state then will lead you back to Washington, D.C., all right? Um, so anybody that's engaged in a business uh, or occupation in the states uh, is subject to subtitle A income taxes. Well, if you understand definitions, that means you have to be involved in an occupation in Washington, D.C. And what do they define occupation as? An occupation is uh, being a pub uh, serving a public office. So by definition, the only ones subject to the Internal Revenue Code are public officials in Washington, D.C. And unless you're one of those, subtitle A income taxes don't apply to you. I mean, that's just one of many things I get into in the book. It's fascinating. That is fascinating. So uh, that's very interesting because one of the ways, one of the things that I've consistently heard is that you have to be a government employee in order to need to have to be, to qualify to have to pay for the taxes, right? So the only people that have to pay, but what you're saying is not even necessarily a government employee, it, it's an elected official. So you could be the, the guard at the front door of a government building getting a government check. And so what you're saying is because that guard is not an elected official, they don't qualify for having to pay taxes. Right. And I've got the specific references in the book. You can look it up yourself. You know, oh, well, that makes more sense to me than all of the government employees have to pay. That actually makes a lot of sense. This is kind of jaw dropping. I'm gonna have to talk to my constitutionalists about this. <laughs> this is good stuff, Mark. Okay, um, I wanna go back to something that I, I have been personally uh, waiting to try to figure out. So maybe you can help me with this. I've been wanting to buy a Black's Law Dictionary. I'm gonna tell you why. So during COVID, you know, we, we get rid of books and we have everything on our phones and even to this day, I, I still put my, uh, my day timer is not in my phone and it's beside me and I still get the printed, you know, version of a day timer, right? Yeah. Because I'm always one dead battery, you know, phone battery away from my whole day being messed up, right? right? So I just don't trust it. I can drop it. So I've still to this day stick to what was working 25 years ago for me. If it's not broke, I don't fix it. So here's the thing. Uh, I have... Um, out of all the things in the world I could have from my grandparents, one of the things that I have in my family room for the last 25, 30 years has been these beautiful leather bound, two part, real thick dictionaries. And uh, then I have a set of a dictionary and a thesaurus that I bought 30 years ago, uh, literally maybe 32 years ago. And so when COVID hit, I started to realize that they were changing some definitions online. I don't know if you know about that, oh, but they yeah. were changing the definition of a vaccine oh, yeah. and it changed numerous times, numerous times. The, de the actual definition was getting changed. So I started to have an appreciation for books, yeah. specifically dictionaries. I started learning about Black's Law Dictionary and what the difference was between a mandate and a law. And I started learning quite a bit about that. Um, and so... I know there are different versions or edition, not versions, but additions to it. Like you just said, you have a sixth edition. And I think the most recent is maybe that I have heard is like a 13th or 15th, something like that. Do you have a specific edition that you recommend that people buy? Well, my only comment on that is to get, get the oldest version that you can find. 
Um, I'll tell you, I, I went through some classes years ago with uh, the Montana Freemen, and I've had a lot of exposure to them and their teachings. And one thing they were doing is they were having people all across the country go to rummage sales and old bookstores and come up with old law books to find out, you know, what were they doing back, you know, in the day. And that's exactly right. I mean, you're finding that definitions are changing, procedures are changing, rules are being tossed out, um, things like that, um, to conform to, you know, the modern day tyranny, which is stripping us all of our rights, you know, and our, our de jure government. So I don't have a specific addition in mind. Um, I would just say, look and dig and see if you can find the, you know, the oldest law books that, that you can get your hands on and they're priceless, they really are. Um, rummage sales, bookstores, wherever you can find these, uh, it's, it's fascinating. Okay, what about as far as, I would almost say that you should get the oldest and the newest, so that way you could compare the two. Uh -huh. um, yeah. What do you find as far as in the court system? Do they tend to go by the most recent version or have you found one over the other? Well, the thing is, um, first of all, your, first, your primary objective is to stay out of court, all right? And that's, that's sure. always, been, <laughs> always been my objective. You know, once you, once you get in there, it's, uh, it's a rat's nest, you know. Um, you're going to get denied due process. I've seen people even be denied uh, a, a defense, you know. They couldn't put up exculpatory evidence, you know. And so, so it becomes a long, drawn-out process where you really have no expectation of winning in court. All you can do is set the record and cause them to make so many errors and denials and violations of due process that, you know, you've got a number of appealable issues and a number of avenues you can take, you know, after they, uh, after they railroad you. And that's basically the current state of the court system. So, um, I've got a, I've got a whistleblower that's going to be on tomorrow and Mark, he says that he's been denied discovery. Sure. Yeah. And anything they can do to, to railroad you, I mean, and, and they're out in the open, you know. Back when I started doing this, they were kind of hiding it all, pretending, at least putting on a good face, you know, that they were uh, following the law and, and providing due process. But now they don't care. It's just out in the open. It's just terrible. It's satanic is what it is. What you're doing is oh, you're, yeah. you're well, going in a star yeah. chamber. Well, um, you know, you have supposedly 12 of your peers, and then you have this 13th person who's cloaked in black. Uh, it's a satanic ritual. And so it's just complete insanity. Uh, I tell you what, though, Mark, as a side note, Saturday's show, I would love for you to see that. And if you want to connect with them, I think they may have some things that they're going to be sharing that has been crazy uh, successful and I'll be interested to hear what your thoughts are after you, love you see yeah. it here with these two. They're it. constitutionalists. It's a husband and a wife that are both constitutionalists and uh, it's going to be an incredible show. It's our second time of doing a Saturday show. Okay, so uh, we got a question from Chatty Chat 2377 that says, when you took on the IRS, did you represent yourself in court? Uh, good did question. You go to court? Like I just said, my preference is to stay out of court, and I didn't really take on the IRS; they took me on, <laughs> and and uh, I basically shut them down. I didn't go into court. I didn't have a court case, right? So that's that's really where you want to be, and 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 you, it's really quite simple. The concept is simple to beat the IRS. There's two things you have to do. There's two roads that they travel, as I say in order to get after you, all right? One is civilly, civil claims. You know, they'll put liens on your property, clean out your bank account, steal your stuff, whatever you got. Civil actions, all right, that's all civil. If you can position yourself, pre-position yourself uh, to be able to uh, be a pauper on paper, yet live like a king, that's where you wanna be. You know, and that's where I'm at, you know. I drive around in a 12-year-old pickup, uh, uh, 
I rent my my houses, and uh, all I've got is uh, some some old shirts and underwear, and six dogs and a beat up pickup truck. So, um, you know, come after it. So that's if. So if you can do that, you've closed the one road that they're going to come after you on. Then the other road is criminal charges. Um, and they have to show willful intent, you know, to avoid your obligations in doing that. And you can establish your good faith intent at complying with the law very easily through documentation. All right. Letters, affidavits. Uh, putting them on the spot. Hey, here's what I understand. If if uh, if this is incorrect, please notify me within uh, you know 21 days. Um, and an unrebutted uh, uh, claim affidavit, you know, stands as fact. All right. So now they can't they can't get you on willful intent to avoid obligations because you're acting in good faith. You are dealing up front with them. They didn't respond, so your affidavit stands as the fact in law. All right, so now you've shown good faith. They can't get you with criminal intent. There's no criminal charges that they can go after successfully. So you've just shut down the That's two roads right. they travel, civil cases and criminal cases. That's really good. Yeah. Um, so Sis Kennedy, so I have a couple of questions off of Sis Kennedy's question. So she says, so if someone has been filing their taxes and then stops filing, will they not have liens placed on their property at some point? I know when property taxes are not paid, the property is sold by the county trustee. Yeah, you probably will have uh, uh, liens filed because you've previously filed, you've previously admitted that you are subject to those codes. And now all of a sudden, if you're not in, in compliance, they'll pursue the civil actions to collect. That, yeah, that's how it works. So what you have so to- So how do you know that? Well, you, you have to get out of the contracts that you signed unknowingly. Basically, you were forced into um, confessions and admissions um, through, through lack of informed consent okay that equates to fraud constructive fraud so when you signed those bank documents you admitted you were a u.s citizen right when you submitted your ss4 form to apply for a social security uh, number uh, you admitted to being a u.s citizen and so many other things throughout life you've 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 made admissions and confessions and these are the documents that they rely on to say, well, you're, you're one of us, you know, you admit it, you know, you're taking the benefits of being a federal citizen. And so whenever you have those benefits, you have a return obligation. All right. So you need, you need to destroy those, those uh, contracts and documents for uh, fraud based on a lack of informed consent. So yeah. Because again, it goes back to fraud. So when, um, I'd be, you know, again, this goes back to definitions and things that we've been led to believe means one thing and really means something else. So legal is not the same thing as lawful. And so that's, you know, we use we interchange those words and we don't understand what they mean. That goes back to Black's Law Dictionary and that they're pulling one over on us all and have been for years, or, well, our whole lives and, and really generations before us, right? And so um, when you took on, well, let me, let me clarify this too, as I keep wondering about this. So Mark, did you ultimately end up paying any money to the, the IRS? No, no. It was all okay. administrative. It was all, all letter right. writing. And you know, I, I sent them enough facts and affidavits and reminders of the law. They finally just gave up on me. <laughs> How much were they trying to get from you? It wasn't very much. I mean, uh, maybe five or six thousand dollars i mean it was nothing was it just the principle of the matter for you or what made you go you know what no oh yeah yeah i'm a very principled individual you know um and i don't participate in fraud i don't participate in uh, uh I, I didn't want to be funding a lot of the things that this government is funding and uh, i just decided you know this isn't me this i'm not one of them Okay, I, I operate in the jurisdiction of the kingdom of heaven, right? And there's only law there. There's no legal, there's no um, codes, there's no uh, regulations, uh, none of that silly stuff that they try to confuse you with, right? So 
that's, that's my attitude. I, un, I operate under the kingdom of heaven, and uh, life is simple there. And so you are a li- living, breathing soul, right. and you are a man. Mm-hmm. Yes, and so, okay, so, so good. I have found uh, something out that's kind of interesting is many of the people that I'm speaking with are believers. You're clearly a believer, and my constitutionalist uh, couple, they're clearly believers as well. And so, which is very interesting that I'm noticing this trend. Um, okay, so are you sovereign? I say no, no. There's only one sovereign in this world, and that's 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 our Lord. So what they say though is they call it sovereignty that you've claimed your sovereignty and not and you've gotten out of the system where you're not, you know, going with yeah, the social security yeah. number and all that. Personally, no, that's what I mean by that. I know, I know. I'm very familiar with it, and a lot of people claim themselves as sovereign citizens, and uh, that that's become kind of a catchphrase, you know, used by the dark side. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're one of them sovereign citizens, and you know they don't even know what it means, you know. So I just try well, to avoid that. That's an oxymoron, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I, I just try to avoid that label, you know, as much as possible. I mean, you could, you could say that, but uh, really, uh, none of us is sovereign. You're either a slave to the world or you're a servant of the Lord. So where does sovereignty fit into that in biblical teachings? Okay, great point. So, as a, so you're a, are you out of their system and just a servant of the Lord? Oh... Well, I've, uh, I've, uh, I've, I've modified my documents with the U.S. State Department so that I have a different contract for my, my uh, USA passport um, that establishes who I am, um, and that's a matter of record. Um, for the most part, Does that yeah. mean you're a traveler? Yeah. I wrote a book. One of my books is uh, Living Free as a PT, Perpetual Tourist, Permanent okay. Traveler. <laughs> Previous taxpayer. So, um, <laughs> I love it. Okay, so I want to make sure that we're clear. And I'm sure some of our, our viewers are not going to know what I'm getting at here. So I want to make sure that, you know, just from an educational perspective. So our God-given right is that we have the right, because we have been in this system. So we've got to clear up a couple of things here. And I want to make sure you and I are on the same page as well. So our God-given right as a living, breathing soul, is that we have the right to travel. So we're really travelers, not drivers, and that we should really have not driver's licenses. We should have passports that allow for us to travel wherever we would like to go throughout the world, because we have a God-given right to be able to travel. We're not supposed to have driver's licenses and all that stuff. You have the right to be able to buy and own property and sell it as you want. And you don't have to, I mean, think about it. You know, uh, you don't have to go and get emissions testing. In fact, in our area, many emissions testing centers have closed down quietly. And so um, I think those are signs of Nasara uh, coming into play. But so, Mark, when I say, so are you a traveler and you're talking about your um, your passport, is that what you're referring to? Yes, yes. In fact, uh, I had my car stolen when I lived in Oklahoma and it had Kingdom of Heaven plates and it wasn't registered to the state. Uh, I, I revoked the registration, the state registration. And the law says that if you have a car in the impound lot, uh, the car was stolen, I was traveling in my, in my RV. Uh, the, I got mail from the apartment complex where the car was abandoned saying, we're gonna sell your car you know, for, for junk you know, uh, if you don't come and claim it. So I called the police, they had a police report. I said, hey, there's the car, go get it. And so they came, took it, put it in the impound lot. And then when I came back from my trip, I went to get the car out. And it wasn't easy, it took several tries because the law says, uh, the car has to be registered, you know, in order to be released from the police impound lot, city impound lot. And uh, I had uh, seen this situation coming beforehand, and uh, understanding the law, I, I got the DMV to write me a letter saying, well, Mark, as a, uh, uh, under the conditions that you say, uh, not being a resident in the state, not doing business in the state, but spending a lot of time in the state, you're ineligible to register this vehicle. And so I had that in writing from the DMV. And ultimately then I showed that to uh, the, the, the guard there and uh, the police released my vehicle. 
um, without having state registration, which was supposedly against state code. <laughs> so yeah, traveling and traveling so and driving is two different things. That's right. And so it's my understanding that the only people that really need a driver's license would be people who are making money like truck drivers or an Uber driver. Um, and so if you're not using your car to, or a taxi driver, for example, it's my understanding. And, yeah, and for so, hire. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, would you say? For hire. Yeah. Driving okay. for hire and a commercial capacity for hire. That's what driving literally there you go. means. Great if, way. Yeah, if you, if you track down the definitions, that's what you're going to find. Yes. Okay. So good. And so, Mark. So you, that. So if that's the case, that when they say you're not doing business in the state, is that what they mean? Is that you're not um, being hired to drive people around or hire, you know whatever driving for hire? Um, that could be, yeah, it could be, or any other form of business or commercial activity. See, um, the statutes and codes are in place to protect the public, all right, from uh, damages in the course of commercial activity, all right? So anyone who's doing commerce with the public can expect to be regulated. That's why uh, private member associations are becoming so popular. All right, we're not dealing with the public. We're dealing only with private members for this service, for this uh, uh, food and drink, for whatever. All right, we're not dealing with the public. Therefore, it's not subject to regulation, taxation, reporting, fees, fines, whatever. That's good. Yeah. So, okay. All right. We got another question for you. Will property in a trust help avoid civil path? Well, it depends on what kind of a trust. You know, a lot of trusts are, are statutory. If they're created by an attorney, you can bet they're going to be statutory uh, trust, which is going to, you know, have the 1041 uh, tax reporting requirements and all that kind of stuff. There's, so you need to have a non-statutory trust uh, of different names for it, Pure Trust, Massachusetts Trust, um, uh, Common Law Business Organization, you know, uh, it goes by different names. Uh, but definitely that's dealing more in the private under private contract and nobody has the authority to violate private contracts especially if it's in the private and it's not created by virtue of any franchise or benefit from the state so you have to you have to stay clear of all state links you know I saw a question up there you know if, if, if you're sovereign can you still take state benefits well See, that, that's the whole thing, you know, we're, we're, we're all tied to the state with all these benefits. And whenever you receive a benefit, you have a return obligation, all right? In order to get that benefit, you had to sign some application form uh, making admissions and confessions that were probably not true if you really understand who you are. Um, that's right. So you really can't have, you know, feet on both sides of the fence. You know, it's either one or the other. And uh, I started a church, the World Mission Church, uh, with the whole idea of helping people come out of Babylon. And we're trying to create alternative systems so that when you leave those things behind, you've got something to step into to replace those, those services and, and benefits to suit, suit your needs. Um, just another one of my many creations. <laughs> Okay, so the three books, so you've written three books here. Um, so you've, uh, and they're all available on Amazon. It, uh, so Living Free as a PT, what does PT stand for? Is it the private traveler that we were talking about? Or what did you mean by that when you wrote it? Yeah, well, there, that's an acronym for many things, you know, uh, permanent tourist, uh, previous taxpayer, perpetual traveler. <laughs> Uh, prepared thoroughly, I could go on down the list, um, you know, and that's an, old, that, that's an old concept that was made famous by uh, W.G. Hill, and I learned from his books, you know, and you might find those on the internet, um, and so Living Free as a PT is just kind of uh, my adventure stories uh, that came about uh, living that way, you know, how it all started, um, you know, basically how to, you know, stay out of the system. So that's, yeah. that's um, go ahead. 
So, so you wrote How I Beat Satan and the IRS, Living Free as a PT. And then the third book that we've got here is One Free Man's War in the Second American Revolution. Uh-huh. And that's, so, that one's really my, my story. Um, that, that's the larger of the three books, and it gets into so many different issues, so many different issues. It's really kind of an encyclopedia of freedom issues and how we've all been snookered and uh, mm -hmm. my, my path and, and my adventures along the way. You know, uh, my grandfather opened up a pharmacy in Chicago in, in like 1912 or something, and he, had, he, he lived through the Al Capone days, and he had so many contacts, and he lived in an area that was really infested with mafioso guys, famous guys, you know, Tony the Tuna, Accardo, and so many others. And uh, we always said, you know, we got to sit down with a tape recorder with him and get his stories. And we never did. And uh, what a what a waste. And so I thought of that. You know, I, I've got so many good stories. I had to write a book. And so there's a lot of good a lot of good stuff in there. Okay, so Mark, I have to say, just because I understand about the pharmacy stuff and the Rockefellers, so 1912. This is right in the same time that they took over the medical industry and the pharma you know, pharmaceutical industry and, and said, okay, doctors are, uh, they took over the medical schools and they said doctors are no longer allowed to be able to talk about holistic remedies that our great, great grandparents used every day, right? right. I used to get kidney stones for about 15 years, every eight, nine months, I was in the emergency room, kept asking the doctors, had numerous surgeries, kept asking the doctors, well, because you know, if you have kidney stone pain, real quick, you're gonna wanna know what's causing it. Nobody seemed to care to figure it out. And then all of a sudden one day I get a statement, I get to looking at the statement after having surgery because I couldn't pass the kidney stone once again. And I get to noticing that the healthcare company had paid the medical industry, the hospital system and the doctor and everything about $11,000. Now this was about 20, oh, ooh, yeah, about 20 year, 25 years ago. So I'm like, I was four, you know, do the math, I'm 29. So, and so anyway, so, so what happened is I started thinking, hmm, they're making a lot of money off of these kidney stones. No wonder why they're not caring, you know, uh, what is causing this. They did not want to have a conversation with me at all. The doctor just shut me down. And so what ends up happening is I found out fresh squeezed lemons in water uh, drinking that regularly will keep you from having a kidney stone. So I started implementing one glass. I, I never liked the taste of, of water out of the faucet, thank goodness. And so I've always had some kind of a bottled water that I've used. And so immediately, I never had a kidney stone since. And it's been, I mean, I drank lemon, fresh squeezed lemon juice with water last night. And so, I mean, I do this every day. Tonight, I, you could, you know, write me an email and say, hey, what are you doing? I'm, and I'll tell you, I'm drinking my lemon water. But I, but I haven't had a kidney stone. Well, that is a natural remedy. And I remember a few years ago coming across something that said that uh, there is not an ailment in this world that the Lord did not give us uh, a natural remedy to. But I go back to what you were saying about your grandfather. You said your grandfather, correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay, 1912, they took over. Uh, that industry and outlawed it in many states it is actually outlawed there is a doctor that I know of right now in the state of Tennessee that's in hot water because she had a file that was seen by an auditor that came into her office where she made a note about recommending a certain remedy that was a holistic remedy it was a spice or whatever and ended up that now she's in hot water and can lose her medical license over it over that Mark, and so 1912, your grandfather's got to ha had to have seen a lot of things happen. Oh boy, oh boy, yeah. And you know, when you hear these stories of these people losing their license, my reaction is, well, good. They need to get rid of the license anyway. You know, and start dealing in the private. Start dealing in the private. Don't deal with the public. Don't hang a shingle out. Don't advertise. Word of mouth. Get your client base built up. Deal in the private, private member association. You don't have to worry about any of that BS. Okay. So we got some more questions. So do, do you think that, and I will see, do you know who David Strait is? Yeah. Are you familiar with him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Someone wanted to know if he was a good teacher of getting out of the system. Well... All I know uh, as of recent is that he's in jail. Um, I know he's been very popular and has had, you know, a lot of good stuff. 
Um, but let me just say this. I've been in jail. I spent a year in prison. And, you know, in the old days, that used to be like a, a black mark on your name, you know, kind of a, a, a smear. Oh, man, that guy, he, he went to jail. I mean, he must be a bad dude. And these days, you know, when it's dangerous to be right when your government is wrong. You know, I ask someone if they've ever been in jail, and they say no. I go, really? Well, what are you doing? <laughs> If you haven't been in jail, uh, you must be not be doing much, <laughs> getting anybody's attention. <laughs> so, uh, so I don't okay. know what that means. Uh, the The system that we live in is so corrupt. I think David teaches a lot of good stuff. Um, I can't say anything bad about it, um, but it, it hasn't helped him. But you know what? You know, I think at this point in time, only God can help us because the system is so corrupt. There is no law. There's no rule of law. There's no uh, constitutional guarantees. They're all out the window. And uh, that's why I created National Action Task Force, to help empower people to know what the law is, stand on the truth and righteousness, and um, no guarantees about anything. Uh, you know, there's no guaranteed remedy, something that works all the time. But, uh, but you need to stand your ground. And the more of us that are doing it, um, you know, the more attention we're going to get and, and more respect we're going to get from these crooks. Okay, so what did you go to jail for for a year? Uh, criminally impersonating myself. It's a joke to this day. <laughs> <laughs> I was helping friends in court as, a, as assistants in counsel, and I had, uh, I had my own uh, homemade ID card that had my, my given name, Mark Emery, without my family name, full disclosure, family name's Boswell, okay? And uh, I got the judge to grant me unlimited attorney-client visiting privileges with a court order so that I could go down and help my friend who was in jail um, who couldn't get any other assistance. He wouldn't work with an attorney. So I present the court order down to uh, the jailers, uh, gave them my ID, you know, sovereign authority to travel ID, had all the, you know, references on it. And it uh, took them the longest time to get that back to me. And I'm, uh, I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. And I knew they were trying to figure out, what are we going to do with this guy? This isn't a state driver's license. Um, anyway, they gave it back to me, uh, pulled me over. And a uh, long story short, because I went with my uh, given name, uh, the charges were criminal impersonation, although they never brought forward anybody that I was impersonating. Uh, the, first, the, the first trial, I represented myself uh, and uh, uh, got a hung jury which I considered a victory. It was long and drawn out, and I figured they're not gonna go through this again. This is ridiculous, but they weren't gonna be embarrassed by you know one of these sovereign citizens. And so they had a second trial, double jeopardy, and uh, tied my hands behind my back, stole my exculpatory evidence, uh, and so many other things. And so I ended up uh, in, in prison for a year for criminally impersonating myself. Wow. Okay, let's look at your books. So we were talking about the three different titles. What's the order that someone should read these books? Start with uh, How I Beat Satan in the IRS. Uh, that's a short, quick read, and it's going to open your eyes. And uh, after that, I would read, uh, um, you know, the first one, uh, One Free Man's War, and the second, uh, American Revolution. Uh, that's just an encyclopedia of knowledge uh, with a little bit of uh, adventurism. Kind of reads like a spy novel. And uh, you'll, I think you'll get a lot out of that. And in the back are all of the uh, biblical references that, uh, that I stand on. That's, that's the law that I go by, um, which are all relevant to what's discussed in the book, of course. So, and then uh, uh, Living Free as a PT is, is, is interesting and fun as well. So. And that would be number three. Yeah. So we're getting that order. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So I, I do not want to end the show until we get through this. We got about four minutes left and I want to talk about your website. W A T F. Uh, Nat, or it's in is it N A T? Yeah. N A T F national action task force. I know that you said that it's more like a, a place for people to go to get the help that they need. Tell us a little bit about that. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah. What we're doing is we're building a, a decentralized national network of concerned Americans who want to defend and protect their rights. And we do that through education. We do that through activism. 
We do that through strategies. Um, we teach uh, um, just a wide, there's a wide gamut of subject matter that we cover. Uh, but it rests on really four main pillars. The first pillar is um, uh, self-governance and common law, okay? Understanding the law, understanding how we need to take back our authority as the source of the law, as the source of the courts, okay? We don't need attorneys and public officials for the courts, all right? That goes back to history and how things have always been done. So self-governance, and common law is the first pillar. Uh, the second pillar is holding public servants accountable. All mm -hmm. right, where to draw the line, what to do when they step over that line. All right, we want to deal with, with honorable, respectful public servants. A lot of them don't know what that line is and they need you to tell them. They don't get the proper training. Um, the third pillar that we stand on is personal independence. And this is where we want to develop alternative uh, sources of health care, medical care, um, you know, living off of the system, uh, getting off the grid, alternative banking and finance. Uh, we have a business club, um, all that type of thing, which is really non-legal. It's more about just living, you know, living with uh, off the system, getting out of Babylon, out of the matrix, right? And then the fourth pillar is just uh, based on building alliances. We want to create alliances with other groups, other uh, individuals, specialists, people that are doing things. We built a separate page to try and bring these groups together just to communicate, all right? Not to, not to interfere in each other's activities, but just communicate, share successes so others can know about that and follow it. You know, share needs. You got an initiative, you need help. Okay, other groups might be able to help you. So that's, that's what the Alliances is all about. So it's based on those four okay. pillars. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say also for everybody, just mark your calendars, 9 a.m. Saturday morning, Central Time. Make sure that you check out the Michelle Moore Show on Saturday morning on Rumble, um, the Michelle Moore Show channel. Uh, that will be a good starting point also for people and then go to this website. And I think that will help you to understand and connect some dots because I think there's that we're going to get a little bit deeper in about the um, affidavits and get that a little bit of that explained. And then I think people will be primed and ready for your website at that point, for sure. I appreciate all of your help and, and uh, sharing all of this, Mark. You, wow, you, um, I love what you said about getting out of Babylon. And I also love that you said, I don't participate in fraud. And at some point, just it's the principle of the matter. Are you, we all have to make a decision about what are we going to do and i say that this is i suspect this is going to be easier now than it ever has been uh for that because we know that major changes are coming i have played the videos a couple of different times from nancy drew and richard citizen journalists showing the irs building in dc and actually the streets in dc are nowhere near what they should be as far as the traveling and cars on the streets like that place is pretty much a ghost town the irs is as well and so we have shown those videos over and over and um especially that nancy drew one is only a couple of months old at the most so i love it i love it i love it and we appreciate you mark we have to have you come back and i have some people i want to connect you with mark so we'll we'll talk all right um woo, don't forget send me your irs stories and what's going on with you and uh, you can always email me at Nashville at Michelle at NashvilleMichelle.com. And we will see you right here next time on the Michelle Moore Show.